Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Three Boca, a ball and blitz pod over here in South Africa. And I have a very, very special uh, co host today, Ms. Ilza Van Staden. How are you? Hi, Andy. I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. The, the sun's been shining. I've burnt myself like a typical Brit. So, uh, yeah, I can't I can't really complain, to be honest with you. I, got I, 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 I honestly don't know what you're complaining about because um, <laughs> uh, I actually forgot about all the daylight savings, that you guys are actually two hours ahead instead of just an hour. And, uh, of course, it's dark at four o'clock. So um, I think that getting burnt by the sun is a bit of a privilege at the minute. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. All right, we're going to bring our first guest. We do have two guests tonight, but one's having a few technical issues. But we're going to bring the first man in. This man used to be the uh, the head coach of the Springbok women's side. He led them to the 2014 Rugby World Cup. Um, he is still actively coaching now, um, and he's just a brilliant guy, Mr. Aslam Abrahams. Hi, Ilza. Hi, Aslan. How are you How are doing, you? both of you? Fine yourself? Doing very well, thank you. Good, nice, good. Nice, nice. Good, good, good. See, I, I, I feel like I'm seeing you quite regularly at the moment, Aslan, which is not a bad thing. Um, I'm going to start with Ilza, though, because everyone thinks that CJ Stander was the first project player to come out of South Africa to Ireland, but I think Ilza might have the claim. In fact, in fact, let me start this. I've never heard anything such as... Uh, where is it? A talent exchange, um, apparently, in 2011. I'm sure it was just that you met your good lady wife and uh, that's why you moved over there, is it not? <laughs> I, I actually wasn't part of the talent exchange, believe it or not. Um, uh, they sent over, the Springbok sent over three girls, uh, Mandisa, um, Fundi, and, um, not, uh, not Natasha, um, Zanay Yodan. And they all came over to play a season in, in Ulster. And as it happened, Ulster sent back three players, of which uh, my my wife is, or now wife, is um, was one of them. And I met Alana in South Africa, and when Alana came back over here, we made the decision of whether she's going to come back to South Africa. And I basically bit the bullet and said, well, what do I have to lose? And I came over to Ulster, and that was nine years ago, and I'm still here. Crikey. Crikey. Missing South Africa? I miss the weather. <laughs> um, uh, my mom is actually currently with us um, for, for Christmas. So uh, my, my, my mom is here. So you miss your family. You miss the sunshine. But uh, there's, there's not a lot of other things that I miss from South Africa at the minute. <laughs> Good. Well, while we're talking, I'm just going to not trying to cut you off. But I am going to try. I believe uh, Natasha is ready to come in. So we have a one of your mortal enemies from Marty's as a, an ex lady, uh, former Bok Western Province captain. Jeez, oh, it goes on. SA Women's Sevens. More importantly, now though, the Under Twenties manager, Natasha Hoffmeister. Are you there? Yay! How are you? Uh, I'm here. Yeah. I'm good. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Brilliant. Awesome. Ilza, just start us off. Um, I want to do a bit of a comparison, if you like, um, from what you experienced as a, a player here in South Africa and what changed for you as a player when you, when you moved over to Ireland. As in difference in systems, difference in attitudes, different in professionalism. Was it chalk and cheese? Because when you left, there was not a lot going on with women's rugby with regard to the spring box. Um, so when I left in uh, at the end of 2011, um, I must say that the setup provincially with the Bulls that we had was fairly good. Um, there was a big investment in your skills and we did a lot of fitness together, whereas um, when I came to Northern Ireland, I started playing for a second division team because uh, there were there were only one all island team in in um, in in Ulster at that stage, and that was Cook, who I currently play for. So I've moved from Belfast Harlequins that I used to play for over to Cook. Um, but there's a bigger focus on skills in 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 Ulster and in Ireland. Um, again, 
a lot of the girls playing in Ulster or a lot of the girls playing in Ireland do not traditionally come from a rugby background. You've got GAA um, and football, which are the two two big sports. And rugby um, has been has been steadily growing in popularity, uh, especially since Ireland has a has a sevens team um, that that was competing on the world circuit up until last season. Um, so that changed a lot because your our seven setup is a professional setup, mm. and that also caused like in South Africa where you had a lot of pl uh, player identification. Um, mm. A lot of players were identified in other sports and brought into the seven setup. The 15 setup is still completely amateur. Uh, you play for your club, you play for your province, which is again still amateur. And if you play for for the national setup, you get expenses. But that is how far it goes. Um, it's not quite like back in South Africa in the day where you had to basically pay your own tracksuit and you had to pay your own. I know that might never have happened with the Springboks, but I remember when we started playing for the Blue Bulls, they, that was the first year where they introduced you basically getting a set of kit. Before that, everybody actually paid their own way. Um, so in comparison to that, things hasn't much changed uh, that much. We are still, we are still amateur. We st are still a group of girls who come to our club. We do have a lot more support. There's a lot more development being done with us in the sense of uh, personal development and again the, the development of skills it's a lot more skills focused um, and a lot of the fitness is actually left to us to do by ourselves uh, and we have to take personal responsibility for that because you can't be a professional even if you're an amateur if you don't take personal responsibility for your own fitness and skills can be worked on as a group mm. Aslam, you obviously took over as the, the women's head coach and took them to the 2014 World Cup. Talk to me about when you first walked into that system and were you shocked in any way, either positively or negatively? And did you have any preconceptions of what it was going to be like? And, and was it a completely different story when you actually got in there? Um, Andy, I will tell you, um, when I came into women's rugby, Natasha will tell you, the night when I got into women's rugby, why we some problems. I told the girls, listen here, I don't know women's rugby. I know rugby. And we are going to focus on rugby and nothing else. I went through Western Province enjoying myself and everything. I got to Springbok rugby. And I think that is where the biggest problem came. At Western Province, I could have, we had our trials. I could have picked my own squad. And I could have gone from strength to strength with the squad. But it's a rugby. You got a certain uh, uh, group of girls that were already in the system. And even though that at that moment they didn't play, they weren't on standard, on par, I had to pick them. So I think um, management by SA Rugby were too involved at that moment by the girls, by picking the team. Um, if, you, if you just check if the, the year when I came to Western Province, I, we were in the finals uh, against the Blue Bulls. Um, three girls from Western Province got into the squad. Three girls of Blue Bulls got into the squad. The border girls, the Eastern Province girls, they weren't even in the playoffs, and they made the squad. 80% of them were in the squad. So I think that at that moment, there were two, the management of SA Rugby were involved at the coaching or the, or the picking of the, of the team, and they didn't allow me with my management to pick the team. So I think that I was very positive when I got there, but after a while I got negative due to the fact that I knew that a certain player can be in the squad playing for me and getting to and get us where we want to be at that moment. And what, were, what, what sort of resources were available to you? Because you hear about these... These coaches are just constantly traveling around the country, going to watch players, going to every game under the sun. Was that what sort of player access were you getting? What were the facilities available? Um, I get some video footage. I had some video footage to watch the girls. And before we went to America for the Nations Cup, 
the only time we were together was two weeks prior to the to the Nations Cup. And we went there with a group of the, uh, 28 girls. When we got there, South Africa, 28 girls. The Americans got like 64. The whole squad was there. The English girls were 52 in the squad. Uh, and, and it was, it was really, it was, we're going there with a step behind all the other teams. Yeah. Ilza, from your perspective, obviously, you've now represented Ireland, which is fab. Um, but when you were coming through the ranks and looking at South African national rugby, was it something that was on on your agenda to represent, you know, where the Springbok shirt means so much here? Or did you feel that it was always going to be out of reach? Um, I was actually part of the Springbok setup. Uh, the, uh, and as far as being um, invited to training camps since 20, 2007. And it was just always, it was always out of my reach. Um, whether I, whether I was the fittest or the strongest, that is that is uh, beyond it. We all know that uh, there's certain certain selection choices being made that people don't always agree with. Take prime example is John Cooney at the minute in the Irish squad. Everybody believes he's one of the best scrum halves in the Northern Hemisphere. He's not in the Irish squad. Um, and as a player, you have to deal with that. And when when I left when I left South Africa in 2011. Um, I, I always felt that that was one of the things that I missed out on. But um, I came to Ireland, I put the work in, and I got selected for the 2017 Women's World Cup in the Six Nations. Uh, Amy Barrett was actually the referee who <laughs> refereed my refereed my my first my first cap. So um, and I used to play I used to play against Amy Barrett. I was in camp when when Amy was still a, a player. I was actually in camp, in camp with, with Natasha several times as well. And I do feel like I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, the South African system is this or the South African system is that. Everybody knows what's happening. Everybody can see what's happening. And I do believe that if, if the coaches are allowed to pick the players that are in form, South Africa will be an absolute force to deal. To, to, you, you, will be, you will literally steamroll the teams. But due Definitely. to due to due to people um, making certain certain managerial decisions, um, South Africa is currently ten years behind the rest of the world. I take mm -hmm. Ireland is about five years behind the rest of the world because we've got that set up as well. Where we're in camp, literally a couple of times before, like a month before the the Six Nations start, and then if there's nothing over summer and there's nothing in the autumn. Uh, there's a couple of checking camps over over that period, but it's not intensive. No. Um, Andy, so, yeah. Andy, I just want I I can can I just ask a question for Ilza? Ilza, you left it 2011, but did you come back to come play for the Bulls in the final? I think it was 2013 against Natasha. Then. Yes. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> Andy, I, I I I just want to tell you something. The, <laughs> the the week before the finals, I just heard about this lady coming back from Ireland. I think your nickname was Killer. Am I right, Ilze? Uh, that's that's a long time ago. <laughs> and I mean, the, the whole week I just had to hear about Killer, 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 and Killer is going to kill us. And I mean, at the at the first three four scrums, she actually killed our scrum. <laughs> so she was on par to get invited to a camp the year after that. And when her name came up, the only thing I heard was, no, I can't invite her. I can't invite her. So obviously, um, I couldn't ask why. There wasn't answers on that. And I mean, Ilza, she's right, stating that the managerial system is involved in the coaching and picking of the teams. And I think that is where we are going wrong at this moment. Hmm. I think one of the big things that we should probably talk about is, is, is after that 2014 Rugby World Cup, obviously didn't play any international rugby for what, three, four years? I think 2018 was the next international rugby, which is fine. 
it's not fine at all. It's actually dreadful. But they obviously pin their colours to the mast of the seven circuit. So a, a question. It was a question for Natasha actually because she was in that squad, and they qualify for the Olympics only for Sascock to say that winning the Af the Pan Africa Championship is not good enough standard for them to put the women's spring box in the Olympics. How are you as rugby people supposed to pick your jaw up off the floor of that and try and continue to move the women's game forward? Andy, I will ask you a question. If this had to happen to the men's team of South Africa, would Saru allow this? No. Now, why are they allowing this to happen to the women in, in rugby in South Africa? There was just a there was a there was a public apology from uh, <laughs> oh, our good friend Regan Hoskins, um, and, and there was no fight. I've, I've read a lot about it today. There was no fight. It was just a we're disappointed with the decision, and and on it goes. But my point is, you go to an Olympics, okay? They probably wouldn't. The likelihood is they wouldn't have medaled, okay? But then saying that, we didn't think Wales would win the sevens, men's sevens World Cup a few years back, right? <laughs> no, <another> way. <laughs> Nobody thought that was going to happen, right? No okay, I'm not saying they would have medaled, but going to the Olympics equals funding. And that's my biggest surprise is that in an amateur game, funding, Ilza, must be like gold dust. If funding is like gold dust. It literally is. Um, I'm not even going to start telling you how much it cost me to to drive up and down to Dublin. Um, I've, I've I, read your interview. I've read your interview. It's a uh, lot. <laughs> it, it, it cost me. It, it cost me um, two people's salary in South Africa to get myself in the position where I could compete with with the rest of the girls. Um, and I'm not just talking about I. I the, the the schedule was absolutely mind blowing. Um, you had all these training sessions that you had to complete. I was driving down to Dublin on a Wednesday to go to do a skill session, where um, from where I live in Northern Ireland, um, Dublin is two and a half hours drive. So I would drive two and a half hours in peak traffic time to get to a forty five minute skill session, to drive back up the road, so that. I could I could get that that input as well, and it it is one of those things. I do believe that if there's more funds being put into women's rugby, and and not just not just towards sevens because sevens is a great game, but you 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 need to you need to protect the sanctity of the fifteens because mm. a girl can play sevens. Yes, so a girl can play <laughs> sevens. Until she's of a certain cer certain age, and then there will always be someone faster, uh, someone quicker. Because sevens game is about quickness. It's about how fast you can move, how quick your decision making is, um, and some of that has to do with with your experience and skill set. But if you can have more girls being put through the fifteen side of rugby as well, um, that would just broaden your player base, and that would really really have a massive impact on the quality of rugby players that comes out of the out of out of South Africa. And in mm. South Africa, unfortunately, rugby is a cultural thing. Um, not everybody grows up with the culture of rugby. Players come from different areas and from different backgrounds. So if you if if you if you look at I'm not saying that if you come from the suburbs, you're going to be great at rugby. That's not what I'm saying. But there has to be that cultural um, point where, where you invest in it and you make players that wasn't necessarily seem to be great because they don't come from a rugby background. You give mm. them the opportunity to be better at what they're doing as well. Yeah, I mean, if there's talented men, there has to be talented women. You know, it just is exactly. really... Before I go back to Aslam for another question, uh, Joe's got a few comments he's just going to throw on the screen for us. And remember our first sevens tournament on the circuit, we ended up in second place, losing only to New Zealand in the final. Olympics, the same could have happened. A hundred percent. Like sevens, you can't predict the result like you can in fifteens. 
as Argentina beat New Zealand a couple of weeks back. But there we go. That's another story. <laughs> but, <laughs> but generally speaking, here you go, one for you, Aslam. Aslam, I remember that nation squad where you had to go into a final day with half injured team. We still got our best result against England ever winning the game until last few minutes, losing the end with one point. You did very well under difficult circumstances. Thank you very much, Aslam. That's a lovely comment. Any more, Joe? I'm moving on. One more. Uh, <laughs> this is this is for Ilza. Are you trying to tell us it's miserable weather in Ireland? No. <laughs> no surprises. <laughs> As I asked, we, 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 we did some work a couple of weeks back, but I'm going to ask you the same question because I really enjoyed your answer. I, I sort of put to you that would it not be better for South Africa to to go back to putting all their eggs in the sevens basket as a just for a couple of years as a pathway to develop more people and make it more accessible to people? We, you know, it's a very different demographic in this country make it more accessible to people and understandable because as an entry level game it's obviously easier to understand than the 15s game and is there is there do you believe that there's the talent right now for there to be a sevens and a 15s program andy there's definitely the talent at this moment um if i check on the seventh circuit the girls playing there they've been in the squad or the system for the last four or five years natasha was there as well there's a lot of girls that I still know that are on the circuit. You have somebody like Zene Jordan. I think she's one of the greatest players in world rugby in sevens. But she can play 15s as well. Um, you've got, you've got uh, Mandisa Williams. Okay, she was uh, the captain before she retired. I think she's one of the greatest players. And she played sevens and she played 15s. But I think the biggest problem, after that question, I've been thinking a lot of this. I think the biggest problem at this moment in South Africa rugby is we are giving money for the rugby to expand in women's rugby. But we're going to the rural areas so that the players can see how the rugby is. How can you get involved with the rugby? Why don't we force... Turkeys, Martis at the Varsity Cup to play sevens rugby just before the game so that people can see that ladies can play rugby. Why don't you force the Model C schools? You've got the biggest inter-schools in Paul, Paul Boys High Paul, uh, and, and, and Paul Gymnasium. Why don't you force Paul Gymnasium and, and Paul Girls High to have a sevens game just before kickoff of the first team? Same can be done by uh, uh, Paul Ruiz. Same can be done by Great College. They've got the mother bodies, the girls that they can play. But women's rugby, there's a tag on women's rugby. Only certain people can play it. It's not like that. It's yeah. definitely not like that. We've got girls out there that want to play rugby. This afternoon, I had a girl coming to me. I want to play rugby. A mother came and her mother heard. A mother asked me, oh, she's stupid. She's stupid. She can't play rugby. Look at her. I mean, she can be the next great sevens player. She can be the Natasha Hofmeister of South Africa. She can be the Zaneo Dawn of South Africa. But the mothers, the fathers need to change their attitude toward women rugby. Imagine somebody, I don't know if you've got a daughter. Kubis Visa's daughter is playing one day for South Africa rugby. Bali Swat's daughter. John Smith's daughter can play for South Africa rugby. But do they have the support from the father? Do they have the, the support of the mother? No, at this moment, we don't have that support for the ladies. Mm. Oh, it, it was a question for Natasha again, but you might be able to help me with this. How excited are you that A, Natasha is involved with the under-20s and also that Lorian Johannes has taken over and the first female coach of a national team? Very excited. Natasha came through my hands. She was my captain. Lorian came through my hands. And if they just are half in it, like they played rugby, they will become great. And they've got the background. That everybody's at this moment. I'm so glad everybody's helping them to get what they needed. Lorian will go far. That I promise you. Natasha, if she's uh, just half the manager that she was a player, she will be one of the greatest uh, managers in South Africa very soon. 
It was, that could have been any country. It just happened to be South Africa, which is puts the icing on the cake. But is how 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 cool is that? Um, I think it's exceptional. I again played with uh, Lori um, with with, with uh, Lorraine and Johannes. Um, she was actually my roommate in a couple of camps, so I've got a lot of time for her. I think she's an exceptional. She was an exceptional rugby player with exceptional rugby knowledge, and the same goes for for Natasha. Um, but you know that South Africa is actually a step ahead because Ireland still doesn't have an official under 20s. Um, we have the Rugby Academy Ireland that has just started started up an uh, under 20s squad. Um, and again, there's ex Irish internationals who are who are taking the lead there. Uh, Fiona Hayes, uh, she's ex Irish prop. She currently coaches UL Bow ladies. She coached them to a. Uh, um, all Island victory last year. Um, you have Ali Miller, who's involved as well. You've got Jenny Murphy, who played centre for Ireland. So they are all involved in that mix uh, with with Rugby Islands, um, Rugby Academy Islands under twenty, which is not an official group. And mm. I do think that if you if you look at the step up, even though we have schools cup, yeah, it's it's not like the schools cups you will have in South Africa. It's not even like the boys schools cup in Ulster. They play on a Thursday afternoon. There's almost nobody at the stadium except for whoever the school bus is in. Um, they, they don't even play full pitch, full contact rugby. There's some of it's tag. Um, and it's, it's more almost like a, like a sevens type, sevens type game where the more, the, 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 um, the Ulster schools cup final is a full blown Uffies boys high affair. Um, <laughs> like you would get in, in South Africa. There are thousands of people who go to the stadium. It's broadcast live on television. Um, so just so that you can measure, that is the difference between men or boys and girls rugby in Ireland. Again, no official under-20s where the Ireland men have an under-20 Six Nations. There's no under-20 women Six Nations. Right. And then whenever those players come up from the junior, the junior under-80s, under 18s, and they step into senior teams, a lot of them have a bloody rude awakening because yeah. they come up against players like me who I am at 100 kilos still um, fairly, fairly physical, uh, where you don't have that level of physicality at your underage, underage levels. So I do believe that South Africa is definitely onto something with that under 20 squad because that will give the girls confidence from from get, coming from a junior squad into the senior squad and um, making a much needed impact uh, in in the international on the international level. Yeah, Joe, I think we've got a comment from Angelique there. Oh, Natasha, making a comeback. Have we sorted it out, Natasha? Are we good. When will they start allowing girls rugby in school? Or even allow them to play with the boys. That is the question for you. You just walk through the door. I've just bombarded you. It's all good. Um, I, I'd flip that on its head and say, when will they allow boys to play other sports that aren't so uh, male dominant? Shall we say? Because um, uh, they're told to is probably the answer to that. Final one on on where um, SA. Let's say senior women's. In fact, no, no. So I'm going to change the tact. Natasha, we were just talking about you uh, getting involved with the under twenties, and Lorian. Um, how excited are you for this this journey you guys are on at the moment? Um, it's 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 a good opportunity for both of us, seeing that we're coming from through through the ranks. I'm very excited for the future, and I'm very happy for Lorian. That's being part of the. Um, the senior squad as well now, being an interim there by um, at their training camp. Um, but I see a big future for the well, the, the ex players coming through. Uh, we definitely know what it is to be players, and now being drafted by SA Rugby into management um, is it's it's great, and um, it's it's a great opportunity for players if they're done playing they should know that there is opportunity for them to become part of management in the SA squad as well. And and the level of talent that you're working with, are you, are you excited about that level of talent? Uh, level of talent with the under-20s, there's, um, there's 
a lot of talent there. Um, I mean, some of them have been drafted up to the senior squad. Um, and there's some of them that's still too young to actually go up to the seniors, but we're already seeing um, the talent there. Uh, we still want to keep the young ones with under 20s to make under 20 squad stronger to compete against, you know, your other international teams. Uh, but I think the under 20s, uh, it's a it's a bigger, it's a good platform basically for young girls to compete in the senior squad. So. Um, under 20 side, South Africa has a lot of talent. They just need to be grafted the right way. They just need to get the opportunities in the right, you know, right timing, basically. You don't want to um, expose them too quickly to the senior team, but you don't want to keep them too long in the under 20s. You have, to, you have to check, you have to kind of sort out the right opportunity and the right time to take them up. But there's a lot of talent here. Mm, no, absolutely. We were talking about the sevens pathway and the uh, unfortunate issues that you had of not being allowed to go to the Olympics. How how um, how that could have been used as a pathway for uh, women's rugby in South Africa. <laughs> but we have yes, a um, yeah. Please elaborate because well, that must have been gut wrenching. I have to say, uh, with the Olympics not not happening this year, um, it would have been a very good platform to see more talent coming through, but also a platform to see where where we are as a team. Um, from pre um, experience, I know that you know when you use your sevens team and put them in the right positions in your 15s team, that's the best. Um, we've done it in the past. We've come very far doing that in the past. And I think, yeah, with the Olympics not happening or basically happening later, um, yeah, it, it is something that you wanted to wanted to kind of get out there and see um, if we can, can compete. But if our sevens players can compete internationally and do really, really good, our 15s team can actually do better. Mm. Speaking of the 15s team, we had the draw for Rugby World Cup 2021 in the week. Aslan, that's some group they've been drawn in, is it not? <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's. You know, when I saw that group, I was like, oh, that's that's a, that's going to be. It's a tough job. It's a tough job. But I think um, with the right direction and with the girls being in the right mindset, they actually know now who they're playing. So they just have to eliminate the teams at the right time, basically to. To get there, it's uh, it's a mind thing now. They have to take it team by team and have to focus basically team by team. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a tough group, I have to say. <laughs> Andy, the question the question I will leave with them is: um, after the first game of the Rugby World Cup, who thought Kulisi will lift the cup? Sorry, and I again? think we just won. It. I said after the first game of the Rugby World Cup for men. We lost against New Zealand. We turned around and we went to go win the World Cup. Personally, I think the ladies is just one hurdle away of greatness. And I think the turnaround can happen in the World Cup. Fiji, we can definitely beat. Yeah. One of the other two teams, we can surprise them. It won't be England, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but all jokes aside, what does what Aslan, what what constitutes a success at that World Cup? And and like without the cliche of being the underdog and gonna win it, is a win against Fiji success at that rugby world cup? And I say that because at the moment, South Africa are thirteenth in the uh, world rankings just above Kazakhstan. Now, I don't mean to degrade anyone here, but we're talking about South African rugby and it's it's not the players' fault that they're in this situation. It's not the coaches' fault necessarily that this situation. We know why. Okay, we don't need to talk about it. So, but you're 13th in the world. Whether you like it or not, what does success look like? <laughs> Andy... Uh Oh, uh, okay. We look at the, where we're lying at this moment. We've got nothing to lose. Absolutely nothing to lose. But we've got everything to gain. And if that girls go on that field, believing in themselves, believing in the process they went through, 
believing in what the coaches have done with them. I think I'm saying this again. We just one hurdle away from greatness. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. I think the greatness is coming at the World Cup next year. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, we'll definitely beat Fiji. We'll definitely beat them. The other two teams, there's a surprise coming. <laughs> beat the Blues. Ilza, a bit of qualifying left to do, left to do for you, uh, <sighs> for your mob. It's a bit of a tense time. A, are you still harboring ambitions yourself? And B, um, what's the general feeling? At the minute, I'm just, I, I just want to go back to enjoying my rugby. Um, the 2017 World Cup at home, as as much as it's a massive privilege to be playing at Kingspan, which is my home stadium here, in front of all my friends and, and the people who supported me the last 10 years, um, uh, it was it, it was a tough one. It was it emotionally took a, a massive toll um, on 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 me and several of the other girls. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go back to just enjoying my rugby again. Um, and if you enjoy your rugby, that's when you play the best the, the, the best rugby. And if I'm fortunate enough to ever ever make it back into the squad, if I if if the door opens, I'll be ready to do it. But I am also I turn 38 next year, and I know Lindsay Peters is, is 40. Um, but Lindsay Lindsay is a is a complete different animal. She took up rugby really late. Where mm. I played, I think this is my 20th. This is supposed to be my 20th season of senior senior interprovincial rugby. Um, as a prop, I still play 80 minutes week in and week out for my club. Um, and that is that is tough on your body. You don't recover as quickly. So, for myself, if I'm privileged enough, if the opportunity comes knocking, I'll take it. But I'm not holding my breath, and it won't completely and utterly devastate me if it never happens again. Mm. Um, as for Ireland, um, I was in that squad that that basically didn't qualify, and it was a really tough pill to swallow. Um, so they they hinged a lot on on placing in the in the Six Nations last year, which uh, it didn't go too well then. Um, they have been building on a young squad, and there's a r couple of really exciting players that's coming through, someone like Dorothy Wall, um, who in the last two games have been exceptional. You've got some old hands like Claire Malloy. Claire Malloy came back from a sabbatical, and the very first game she was back, she got player of the match. But there's a lot of the Irish, Irish game, uh, girls who currently actually play in England um, and they play in that premiership, which is semi-professional. Um, mm. They got treated, that they get treated like professional rugby players. And that league is actually still going where the All-Ireland League is to an extent being suspended due to COVID. So the first thing that the Irish woman needs to do is they have to go to that European qualifier, qualifier and hope to, to, to gain a place there. And I think there's still, is it the final, final qualifier that is still open? Um, but they have a shot still uh, against the likes of Scotland who upset them last year. Mm. Um, but the Scottish women are, are having their own issues. I'd say due to, Due to um, health issues, the ex Island coach uh, Goose uh, Philip Doyle has stepped away, and they now have an interim coach. You have COVID that's playing havoc with everybody's schedules, and I would say that if if the Irish women was playing those qualifiers in December, like they were scheduled to go ahead, they would have qualified. But yeah. it's again, it's again being put back with nobody really knowing what's going to happen to the Six Nations next year, what's going to happen to the qualifying process. I just think that Ireland will either end up playing a lot of rugby in the lead-up to the qualification, which might make them really sharp, uh, or, or it will go completely the, others, the other way, where you will have a squad of 40, 50 players, um, with some players being completely and utterly overplayed. Uh, that would be detrimental to 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 the squad and and how they get together. Yeah, Joe, quick 
quick comment there from Joe Lyons, if you wouldn't mind putting that up. The GAA put their foot down and cut off the stream of players that were crossing over from Gaelic. If we had them, it's like Hills is nodding away. Like a, if we had them, we'd be a hell of a lot stronger. But like South Africa, poli politics and sport. <laughs> politics sometimes sometimes gets in the way. Um, and have you got time to put it up uh, Ashin's uh, on there for us as well? Comment. Well, he's trying to multitask. Maybe I'll read it out. Scotland looked very good last year on their SA tour. It's disappointing to hear Scott step down. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, look, we just want competitive rugby across the board. We sort of almost want it to not mirror the men's game at all. That's not what I mean. But more competitive nations is what I'm saying. That, that like every test match is, uh, is good. But I think we're getting there. And I think uh, Natasha... Just to jump back to you on where SA Rugby's heading at the moment, I've been reading quite a bit. They're starting to bring on Stat Sports, for instance. I see social media looks a lot better now. There's a there's a box women's. We'll carry this conversation on anyway. There's a box women's um, Twitter page that's got eleven thousand followers on it. Like I said, Stat Sports are on board now for SA Women, so we're actually getting some professional data back. There seems to be more positive chat around national South African women's rugby at the moment than there has been in the past, or am I misreading that? Natasha, did you hear that? Maybe Aslan, what are your perceptions uh, yes, at the moment uh, of that? Yes. I could, so we were just saying that um, South African the, the sort of noise around South African women's rugby seems to be a lot more positive at the moment with the fact that like stat sports have come on board to give you more professional uh, data, for instance. Um, we've got the first professional player, albeit going to Spain, but maybe we, we might actually get a household name in, in, in women's rugby in South Africa like we do. Like in England, I can reel off 20 players. No, no problems at all. I'm not sure there's too many male rugby fans in this country in South Africa that can do the same for whatever reason. So you now obviously Papalwa has gone over to Spain and she's the captain and she's she's you know got a professional contract. The way I'm reading it is that maybe women's rugby in South Africa has been taken more seriously than it has before. Would I be right in saying that? Aslam what are your perceptions over this? Oh, sorry. Go, Natasha, go. Yeah. Um, I think with with, 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 with women's rugby, uh, I don't think it's a household name yet. Uh, there's too many people that still doesn't know that women can actually play rugby. Uh, from a positive side, from players' um, side, actually, is that I think that players should own up to it. Uh, players should be proud to uh, proud about the fact that they do play women's rugby and they should actually be representatives um, in their own right. And I think um, if the players can take that ownership, there would be uh, more people that know about um, women's rugby in South Africa. And I think that's basically how we're going to be, women's rugby is going to be a household name. Um, so yeah, I think that um, more positive um, feedback will come from the community, will come from people when players take the ownership of, you know, I'm representing my my country. I'm not just representing myself, not representing my my um, province, but I'm re actually representing my com my country. Yeah. Mm. This 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 is a fairly loaded question that might end up in an hour long. But what can we? do better what are we not doing right and i and i'm gonna use an example here because when i was doing research for tonight i saw a very very awkward interview with yourself natasha back in 2012 on cape rugby tv and i am telling you now if i ever host the way that man hosted because he's smiling already let me just there's some of the quotes i've got some quotes here um he asked if you all wear pink um and when you said that there was 500 potential rugby players coming to a women's rugby event on Women's Day, he, I think he's, his, his eyes almost popped out of his head and he went, 
that many women, um, I think he said girl, um, whatever. And he also said he needs to stand up because there's a, there's a lady in the studio. Your face tells me a story on that interview. I'm hoping we've moved on from those times, but maybe for Natasha and Ilza, are we moving in the right direction socially with the way that we as fans, we as human beings, are talking and referring to women's rugby and what the hell do we need to do? Because a lot of us need a slap in the face. Let's be quite frank about it. <laughs> and from from our from, from our point of view, we had um, that big hoo ha with the it, with the with the international jerseys um, being launched oh. and. They couldn't use men. They used the men to launch the jerseys, but they fell flat on their faces. And a lot of that has been fixed. I take even at Ulster, they have used. I'm very lucky that they never asked me because I'm just like, no, I can't do that. Um, but they used actual players. They used Kat, they used Catherine Dane, who who plays for Ireland. Um, they used Linda. They used um, Lindsay Pete. They used. Uh, What's her name now? I can't think of it. Now it's just gone. Um, but there's several of the Irish girls, uh, Ema Considine, that, that were used in the launch of the Irish women's jerseys and in the launch of the Ulster, uh, Leinster, Connet, as well as Monster jerseys. It's not models anymore. It's actual women's rugby players. And you still get, you still get the comments because I would sit in the back of the bus. Um, I would sit at the back at at as uh, at the venues i would sit in the back at, the, at our club and you sometimes still get the comments of she's too pretty to play rugby and you'd be like you clearly haven't seen the smiling psychopath come out and that girl on the rugby pitch um <laughs> she can dress very nicely off the pitch but whenever she gets that ball in hand she is an absolute monster so don't judge the book by a cover and i know that south africa again culturally uh, men, women in South Africa, they don't really do the whole thing with, uh, oh, so you're a girl, so you should have rights. Um, so, so why do you want to play rugby? You're a woman. You have to be in the kitchen, stood in front of the stove. You need to look after the children. Why do you want to go to university? Why do you want to finish school? Unfortunately, that is, um, unfortunately, that is still a realistic Thing, that, that is a reality for, for a lot of girls in South Africa. It's the gender stereotypes that get put on them and the family responsibilities that get thrown on them because that is what you are meant to do. And they don't, I was an educator, I was a teacher in South Africa and I saw that in my classroom. I taught at an inner city school um, and I saw that where I had parents tell me in grade 10 they wanted to take the children out of school, end of grade 9 because no, she needs to come look after the small children. You're like, but she can do so much more. She can be so worth so much more to your family in the long run if you go and allow her to get a proper education. Because um, what is it? Someone who is who, who gets a trick, and I know this other in South Africa working is a is is a bit of a uh, you've got a really big um, unemployment issue in South Africa. And you have a lot of people living under the breadline. Um, <coughs> but you can you can support your you can support your family more. Um, people, someone with a matric certificate uh, earns roughly about fifteen percent more than someone who left school at any time before. Um, it's a thirty five percent higher income for someone who is um, who has a degree level education. So, Andy, what Ilza is actually saying, we need to get rid of the tag on women's rugby. Yeah. yeah. As soon as we get rid of the tag on women's rugby, we'll get somewhere. And mm. I think five years ago, I don't know if Natasha is going to say yes or no, but if South Africa rugby made something about Madisa Williams, I class Madisa Williams on the same level as a Francois Pinard as a John Smith. She's the Francois Pinot John Smith of women rugby. And if we took her five years ago and made her the ambassador of women's rugby, women's rugby in South Africa would have been big already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And Natasha, please finish us off on this subject because you must get it all the time. And usually from a usually from a man who will go back to his house and say, oh, no, rugby's for everybody. That's why I love it so much. It's for all shapes and sizes, da da da, da. But really, that's not what they think at all. Um, what are we doing wrong? And do you agree with us, I suppose, everything else? That, have you got anything to add to what Ilza and Aslam have said? I want to add. I want to add on to what Ilza said. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's too many people that think that w when a woman plays rugby, then she's automatically supposed to be a butchy girl or uh, more less feminine than you know a girl's supposed to be. Uh, but I think that that's that's where the problem comes in because. Not all rugby players are butchy girls, not all rugby girls, um, you know, is less feminine. Um, we can get into our rugby gear uh, for rugby training, but as soon as we want to go out or have a fun time, we can also, you know, dress up nicely, do our hair, put on some makeup or heels or whatever. Um, so, so I think um, it's that whole thing, I will think that that plays rugby is supposed to be butchy girls and not all of them as, as butchy yes you can't choose ladies that play rugby that's more butchy that's that's what they want to be but at the end of the day we're still women it uh, doesn't matter if we're less butchy or or not um i think um the fact that uh People automatically think that, okay, it's women's rugby, so they need to wear dresses when they have to wear formal wear. Not all girls look nice in formal wear when it comes to dresses. Uh, but I think everybody looks great when it comes to nice formal pants or shirt, but it's still feminine. It's still ladylike. Um, I think there's too many people in the country that think that all women that play rugby are supposed to book, and that's not the case at all. Yeah, I'm cringing. I'm absolutely cringing there. What actually? Not I'm not digressing, but that uh, England England rugby did a, an amazing bit of content a couple of years ago, and they um they got all the the, the women rugby players, the Molly Watermans and people like that, all in the same room, and they asked them questions that they they found on social media, such as, "Does it hurt your boobs when you play rugby?" Um, are you all lesbian? Um, are you? It was, but it was brilliantly done. The the girls embraced it. It was absolutely amazing, and I hope there was a lot of people sat at home like cringing. My final question to all three of you: I love this question. You got one thing, one thing only that you can change in women's rugby in your country, club, world rugby. Put yourself in the chairman of world rugby right now Ilza, i'm going to start with you what would you change exposure because if you can't see you can't be Sorry. done <laughs> aslam introduce rugby to great one t uh, learners straight in there natasha you can change one thing in women's rugby in the world right now what would it be Well, she's just trying to get really bring up again some some brilliant comments and thank you so much everyone for your comments on the side. So if we can agree a thousand percent with you, Asim, and this is a legend, easily one of the best in the world. And uh, I like Joe's comments to possibly see us out here, Joe Lyons. And I agree with you. There are lads that I've played with that spent more time post training titivating themselves than my two teenage <laughs> granddaughters getting ready for an eye out. I was uh, uh, there's two there's two two shocking sides to the story. Uh, a I was in the gym yesterday, which is shocking in itself. But when I when I came out of the showers, I was there, there was a 16 to 18 year old lad to, top off in the mirror doing all sorts of poses and I was so close to going over to him and if I ever see him again say please don't do that don't like <laughs> he was there for ages and he's only just given himself a complex but anyway that's another story it's another subject for another day <laughs> school boys rugby is gonna have to be about a three hour one I think guys brilliant chat tonight I love this format because we're just so open and honest and we get it all out of our systems put the world to rights and um hopefully other 
people may listen um, and realise that there's so many good people in the world rugby, in the game, and especially in the women's game. There's there's such good rugby out there in the women's in the women's game at the moment. And in fact, let's be honest, the standard of the Red Roses game the other day was better than the England Ireland game by a country mile so don't be scared guys switch it on go and watch it don't think it's going to be slow and drop balls everywhere watch the skill level it's unreal it's absolutely unreal but um until next time natasha's dipping in and out but we will thank her off screen aslan thank you so much for your time tonight it's been um absolutely amazing to to catch up again as always ilza the killer i'm glad you're uh across the screen she doesn't like it she doesn't like it and she's a butcher I, I actually don't like it. I actually <laughs> despise that name. Yeah, you decided that, well, I suppose you don't kill the animal as a butcher. You just chop it up into little pieces, which is really nice. But, and on that note, on that bombshell, we shall leave it to this, this evening. And um, Ashin's just come up there. I still feel for France. I don't. Emily Scarrett deserves a statue outside Twickenham. Right. <laughs> we shall see you all again in two weeks. Till next time. Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Ike.